Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy. Today, coming at you from the great indoors, um, I'm uh, recording another interview with me and my friend Ant Insuli over back in England. Uh, I'm recording this on the 18th of July. 2024 which um, will go down in history as a ridiculously historical week um, for and the archaeologists will be digging this up as well as the geologists never mind the normal historians that's for sure um, so um, yeah it's uh, I meant to talk to you actually didn't I last weekend but I was a bit too ill so um, yeah when we yeah. Um, delayed yeah. it uh, suddenly politics got a lot more interesting in that time it, it, so, it did yeah. yeah so thank you Niall for having me uh, back for being a returning guest that's very kind of you and, and uh hi everyone mm. out there listening and watching mm. um yeah i think we originally we were going to get together to um talk and share about the starmageddon the election that wasn't um oh yeah and then in his own in 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 a can't never say that word yeah but uh <laughs> style um the dynamic um starmer was usurped by mr trump yeah, that's so, right. Yeah, as you said, things have moved on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's you know um, a couple of things that I've um, noticed is that when Starmer was elected, the first, one of the first things that he done was uh, was uh, was it get David Lammy as foreign secretary. Oh God! And, and yeah. I just thought, what a, you know, he said all sorts of nasty things about Donald Trump being a misogynist and Nazi and all of that. He's another one of these people who called him Hitler. And the first thing he does is play the race card as well. You know, he says, I'm the first black working class foreign secretary and all that. And um, I mean, with me, I've never really had a problem with um I've never had a problem with um, David Lammy being black. I've never had a problem with him being working class, if he really is. My real issue with him is he's fat. You know, and um, he could do with eating <laughs> a few less corporate lunches. I mean, he's, he's definitely new to the... Um, new to that kind of food they don't serve that sort of food in tottenham that's for sure but apart from that i've no issue with his um protected identity traits however he seems to have a problem with other people's identity traits so uh, in a way i wish they had diane abbott in the in the, the cabinet because i mean she's just so utterly dumb it would just uh, you know it would just it would be good comedy i thought well the state of british politics at the moment that it's just asking for spitting image to come back i mean you know, I, I don't want to be one of these people who freaks out about how you know, tyrannical everything's going to be, because no matter how tyrannical it's all going to be, it just seems to be overshadowed by farce. Everything about it to me is like that right now. Yeah, so uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I knew they were going to come in, but it's just that, you know, you've got this window dummy who looks like a, a Jerry Anderson puppet running the country. And then you've got Ginger Growler. Eh, hey, Northern Monkey! Eh, 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 Northern Bloody Monkey! Eh, hey, you're all a bunch of scum! And she's the Deputy Prime Minister, right? And, my God, it's embarrassing. It really is. The I very think... epitome of a borderline, the very epitome. Oh, God, yeah. I tell you, I'm glad I've got two passports, man. I can pretend to be from somewhere else. You know? <laughs> oh, well, what is there to say? I mean, David yeah. Lammy, uh, is he the guy that said that men can grow cervixes? Yeah, uh, that's right. I think right. he might have been. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he one. also has that, that classic sort of um, bubble head syndrome. So as he's got fatter, mm. um, as I've reached middle age, I've gone I've, I've gone the whole jowly, skinny face route. Mm. But he's gone the whole male middle age where his head is just expanded like a huge melon. So I think <laughs> I think that's what you what you mean. But yeah, he does. Sorry. Yeah, he does reek, reek of just, yeah, stunning ineptitude uh, and yeah. mediocrity. It is. Yeah. The um, the 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 new Labour, the new Labour cabinet, when I saw some of the pictures of their first cabinet meeting, their sense of, I would say, entitlement and self-importance that they think that um, apparently their big um, their big selling point is they're going to be able to grow the economy more efficiently, um, more efficiently than than the Tories. But the ironic thing about that is that, mm -hmm. of course, I think it was new Labour under Tony Blair. One of the first things he did or well, the Chancellor, Gordon Brown, at the time, was to give independence to the Bank of England. Now, oh, yeah. to what extent can the UK national government grow the economy when they haven't got all their hands on the levers, on the economic levers? Now, I believe, a bit of a controversial view for you here, um, you know, Liz Truss, mm. it, it is said that she stumbled across this, mm. um, that she kind of worked out 
that um hold on a minute why is the government not setting interest rates what you know why does the bank of england have all this power Mm. now i do subscribe to this view that's been put out by some people that the reason why they quickly rubbished her with this whole nonsense about one um budget destroying you know uh destroying the uk economy or destroying the pound that was the issue wasn't it Mm. and um you know they were putting out all this stuff about her being totally inept and crazy i'm not saying she isn't but i think she stumbled upon upon a truth Mm. and they had to quickly uh um you know turf her out um so anyway my point is uh, i'm not sure that labor will succeed in in uh, growing the economy any more efficiently um, because, as we know, uh, that that role is is given to um, the Bank of England. Yeah, uh, and that's my point on that. <clears throat> yeah, well, Tony Blair handed over power to the Bank of England because you remember back in the day when um, yeah, well, I remember when it was Margaret Thatcher and like, Nigel Lawson, and then John Major took over as Chancellor, and then the Prime right. Minister, uh, Norman Lamont yeah. took over. Well, yeah, I mean they were setting the interest rates. And I still remember watching, um, what was it, back in the day when Terry Wogan had his show and occasionally Sue Lawley used to stand in for him. And she interviewed Nigel Lawson. And, you know, even he said, you know, well, uh, when I put the interest rates up, I have to pay the extra money on my own mortgage um, as well. So, you know, that has pretty much been taken away from the politicians um, now, you know. Yeah. Whereas, um, you know, we thought they were bad then, but my God, I mean, they were, I mean, they were like, uh, I don't know, they that they were like masters of their craft compared to the idiots that we have now. But, yeah, I mean, Tony <laughs> Blair just... Uh, he's done so much damage to the UK. And when he um, got rid of the law lords, replaced them with the, with the Supreme Court. So um, it's like as if right. Parliament doesn't have any power. The House of Lords doesn't have any power. Uh, Britain has pretty much uh, become a quangocracy over time. And, um, you know, I don't know what the hell... I don't know what the hell they're there for. We might as well just not have them at all, really. So, I mean, I've no idea what to expect from Labour, but uh, all, I, all I know is that they, th- th- we only have people who know how to manage decline in the UK at the moment. And, um, and that's, that's it. And uh, again, you know, one of the things about the, the first-past-the-post system has led to um, Keir Starmer's government had just over double the amount of votes that Nigel Farage's Reform Party had. But he had somewhere in the Indeed, region yeah. of 90 times the seats. And um, yeah, but, reform had one percent of the seats. Yeah, yeah. Except that there is one thing, though. Of course, is that with um, this new uh, Labour majority, it's, a lot of people don't realise it, but it's actually extremely precarious because um, a lot of their seats they won with extremely narrow margins. Um, uh, I think uh, was it up to about ninety plus uh, seats. Reform come number two, so reform could actually topple them very, very easily. Yeah. And then um, the um, next uh, issue is the fact that. Um, well, uh, Jess Phillips, I don't know if you saw the Jess Phillips incident, but uh, she uh, she was one of a few uh, parties, well, no, she was one of a few MPs where she almost got beaten by an independent who was pro-Hamas. There's something like about right. five of these Islamist independents, if you include Jeremy Corbyn now, in Parliament. Yeah. Um, there's uh, yeah. F- four of them with uh, Arabic or, you know, with like Muslim names. Uh, like Iqbal and Mohammed yeah. or whatever. Um, so you've had this Muslim block voting. You now have uh, sectarian religious politics in the UK now. And um, Jess Phillips uh, almost lost to one of them by just a handful of votes. And um, she was being shouted at. And um, she looked really freaked out. She looked like, well, she does look like she's in danger, to be honest, you know. And. Um, yeah. But she can't bring herself to mention what the problem is. She can't actually say that these people are Islamists. She can only say that they're men, which goes uh, goes very well with that pro-feminist narrative that she had. Um, but she honestly does look like um, she's, uh, you know, she could be in danger. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's been an increase in political violence um, recently in the UK. And, I mean, you know, we wouldn't want anything to happen to Jess Phillips. Unlike, not unlike the lefties who wanted um, them not to miss Donald Trump, of course, you know, but in the case of Jeff <laughs> Phillips, we can actually see that she did look like, you know, no matter how much she was trying to hide it, she did actually look like she was living in fear of violence. And um, yeah, I yeah. didn't, I didn't, I didn't know about that. I was just going to say the the yeah. mic, I'm not sure if the audience, the listeners are picking up on this, but occasionally, yeah, you're dropping out. I'm not sure. Um, oh, not on my end, I'm not. 
No, I oh, think okay, that's it might be your Skype yeah, yeah. connection. Mine's going directly oh, okay. in, so at my end, um, it's going to oh, be okay. Pe- as, long, as long as as long as the audience are getting a, a, a continuous feed, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt there. So, yeah, luckily I, enough, I, your I signal's admit... coming through okay. So, yeah. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see that. Um, I didn't, I didn't see that um, on the news. Of course, because you can't go the whole hog, and because you'd be accused of being, um, you know, uh, a, a, of islamophobia so this is again interesting where we're now living in times where the whole woke thing is just going to fall apart because all of the inherent contradictions the positions Mm -hmm. that they're holding are so um they're so sort of inherently contradictory but yeah that is of course that's very um that's very disturbing I, i i mean i just would like to say i mean about the election of course they didn't um not that i haven't really watched much of the post election coverage um but i believe the turnout was only 60% which just looking at some official stats um the other day it's the mm. lowest turnout since 1945 yeah but what they failed to mention was and i'm not a supporter of jeremy corbyn but i think what the labor party did to him um, the whole anti-Semitism BS uh, was disgusting. It was mm. absolutely disgusting, the hatchet job. But anyway, he, um, he even in 2019, when he lost to uh, Boris Johnson's Just Get Brexit Done, he got more than the last week, or whenever it was now. And he got two million more in the 27, 2017 election when it was a hung parliament. So, yeah, it certainly is, as we know, a very hollow, precarious victory for Labour. A very yeah. very um but this rise of is, is islam in in certain areas yes is very worrying yes you're quite right to raise that issue i wasn't aware of um, yeah. this particular instance well you know yeah. in the case of uh, jeremy corbyn i mean even back in the day i know that uh, when they accused him of being anti-semit anti-semitism or, or when accused him sorry put my teeth in accusing him of being anti-semitic i think there were elements of truth in that because you know he had come out and said that he considered um hamas and hezbollah to be his friends and you know all right that's not going to help himself is it no but at the same time i mean from my perspective as well you know during the during the troubles uh he was also referring to the ira as being his friends and wanted to invite them to parliament not all that long after they blew up the conservative party conference that nearly took out maggie thatcher so i don't know i, I think he's a bit of a danger personally um for jeremy th- corbyn yeah as i yeah i've lost sight of that i think the thing with him is um mm. there's a t- dangerous level of naivety there mm. Um, it was a bit like to put it in a truth alternative sphere. I'm, getting, I'm not going to criticize David Icke here because he's done amazing work and he continues to. Mm. But it was a bit like during one of the COVID marches and he was shouting, David Icke, he was there, freedom, freedom, and all this. Mm. I think some of these figures, um, yeah, they do have <laughs> this. I mean, no one's perfect, are they? Are they? And we put them on pedestals. Um, mm. There is a sort of a dangerous level of naivety there um uh sometimes and i think um yeah yeah we 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 can we can lose sight of that yeah that was is um interesting that you uh mentioned that yeah yeah and i think also mm-hmm. that you know in, in the case of uh what we've got as well with the i suppose with with the the whole lefty thing that's going on at the moment there are some serious dangers because you know i mean there's this rumor i don't know how much truth there is in it but um keir starmer wants to bring in this bill that will make it pretty much illegal for you to make any criticism of Islam or Muslimness, as they call it. But at the same time, if the Britain, if Britain ends up having problems with like sectarian violence, and politicians are at risk of, um, you know, because as you know, the the left wants to include all the disadvantaged people, um, and when the Muslims realise that they don't need to use the left anymore, they will throw them under the bus. And say right. Oh, the useful yeah. idiots. Yeah, oh, absolutely. They'll yeah. say right, Labour. You've you've outlived your usefulness. We don't need you anymore. We can now do our block voting. We don't need you. And then they'll turn against the Labour Party, and the Labour Party will bring in legislation which will make it illegal for people to complain about the risk that they are at themselves. And um, you know, this is how yeah. stupid it's all becoming. And uh, you know, the other the other downside is, of course, when they take the nuance out of everything, because like I say. I've got no issue with um, 
if I, if I was still in England and I was going down the road to get some uh, cigarettes or whatever from my local friendly Pakistani um, shop or whatever, I'd have no issue with him. And I yeah. wouldn't treat him kind of in the same way as I treat those people who shout out, um, what is it? Uh, what's that called? Ali's Snack Bar. That's my name for it now. Uh, Ali's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. The, the people who now have these signs up saying, death to all those who insult Islam. Those, those crazies. Now, they, they only make up a small amount, really. But at the same time, um, this whole thing about Islamophobia is that it, doesn't, um, it does not bring all that nuance into consideration. Because, you know, at the same time, there are plenty of moderate Muslims who would like to be able to complain about that. And then, of course, them, they will get, uh, they will be on the receiving end of a lot of this flack as well. Like, say, for instance, that um, new uh, chairman that they've got in, um, in, in Reform. What's his name again? Zia Youssef. He's um, a self-made man, um, you know, multi-millionaire. He, he basically uh, bung a lot of money towards um, Reform. And, well... I don't know if he's a Trojan horse or not. We can only hope not. But if you assume that he isn't a Trojan horse, he does speak like he's proud of Britain and he uh, wants to help. Now, uh, he uh, will, you know, he's already been on GB News talking about how bad the immigration problem has become and how, you know, when his parents first came over, there was only 10% of the immigration that there is now. And a lot of the opportunities that he was uh, privy to wouldn't probably be available anymore um, if he was just born now. And um, if he was talking about uh, the threat of Islam in the UK as a Muslim himself, would he be uh, at risk of this new legislation? So this is what I see um, at the moment, that uh, this new legislation will cause more problems because if there ends up being a real problem, imagine if uh, back in the time of the Troubles, and I mean, you know, I'm from a fully Irish background, but so, but imagine back in the time of the Troubles, if people couldn't complain about Irish republicanism, you know, um, and, and they said, you can't complain about Irish Republican hate speech. And then I'd come out and I'd say, well, my parents are from Ireland. My parents are from the Republic of Ireland. I don't want to be blown up by the IRA. I don't support them either. And they'll say, hate yeah. speech, and they'll put me in prison. And, and it's like, that never happened back then. But this is the sort of risk that we could end up um, being under, you know, this is the problem that we could end up risking in this uh, present modern age. If they, you know, because... Well, this the whole notion of Islamophobia is just ridiculous. You know, my, my whole attitude is that if you've got a group of people who um, are hostile, if they are following a very rigid um, ideology that um, is, uh, you know, the, there, are no, there are no compromises with it at all, and they just talk about death and destruction to anyone who does not conform to their way of being, I don't care whether race is involved. I don't care whether any of this stuff is involved or not involved. It's a hostile ideology. I feel the same way about the middle class white lefties as I do in this sense. And I'm not racist against white people. I am a white person. Mind you, I do consider being middle class to be a personality disorder. But that's different. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. but so, so these um, are the problems that I see that are going to be mounting up now. You know? Yeah, um, yeah, so good points you make there. Just back to one of the previous points you make, I do think that um, Starmer is in situ or um, in place to, like you were talking about, man the managed decline of, of Britain mm. is, is very stark. And I know it can become a bit of a cliche, but um, when I talk to people, just, you know, the, the NHS and just the way in which um, companies operate, customer service, there is this... It's getting to the stage now when when things actually work, you're surprised now uh, yeah. in the UK. Yeah. Um, it, it literally, I I am when when things go smooth. It's like, oh my god, I didn't have to follow up because something went wrong. So he is there to put a a corporate kind of smile to that um, mm. Starmer. But in terms of um, what you're talking about with this sort of um, new legislation coming in that mm. uh, is rumoured, um, I think. What's happening if, is that, as I said before, because woke is self-imploding because it's such a ridiculous kind of ideology in a way and the whole cultural Marxist identity politics, um, what seems to be happening as the, the positions that these um, people adopt, um, 
like Jess Phillips, as it's become so um, ridiculously contradictory, uh, and as the position there is becomes narrower and narrower and narrower, because as we know, politicians will never look within, they never see the kind of psycho spiritual dimension of life. Yeah. And they always point the finger, they have to create more and more extreme um, legislation, which means that they never have to look within, I think, on a kind of more zoomed out perspective. And that's what's really dangerous, yeah. because there's this sort of self blindness that will eventually create a sort of a legislation a minefield that's going to, I think, that's where it is deliberate, just pit every man and woman mm. uh, against one another, what, whatever kind of ethnic or religious group they come from. I think there is a planned element to that uh, and some might even go so far as to say a civil war aspect yeah and you know it has the potential to be to be pretty to be pretty nasty yeah yeah but but where i kind of think is it's all going wrong for them is the fact that they um the more overconfident they become the more hubristic they become the more they start yes. underestimating the public and the more they start overestimating themselves and yeah. um you know like uh but, but at the same time, a lot of stuff um, seems to be coming out now. It's like, uh, for instance, um, I think of this, like, you know, if we go over to the attempted assassination of Trump, um, one of the things that I, I noticed there was, this was like a moment where you turn the light on and you see all the cockroaches, um, you know, scuttle away. <laughs> it was a bit like that. It was a real <clears throat> enlightening moment because... Um, it was. Uh, I'll get to the the assassination bit in a little while. But there was this NatCon sure. um, pro, uh, conference in. I don't know where it was. It's somewhere in America, and a whole bunch of Brits went there, including Carl Benjamin and um, and uh, was it Connor Tomlinson of the Lotus Eaters? They went there and spoke, and um, a few uh, a few other people. I think um, Suella Braveman went there as well. And when they were there, um, I think was his name. Is his name uh, J D Vance? He's supposed to be the new um running mate going with trump so if trump oh, she wins... suddenly appeared she yeah she suddenly appeared out of nowhere yeah that's so the name. yeah go. yeah so so yeah. he um come up with saying he says um we were talking about which country is going to be the first um nuclear powered um islamist state and he said we were thinking maybe it might be iran maybe it's already pakistan but he said maybe nowadays <clears> it's <throat> britain now that labor have been um e elected and uh, that went down to a few laughs so he was being tongue-in-cheek when he said it but the uh, the sort of you know the the lefty media in the UK got their knickers in a twist about all of this and started um you know talking about how this is going to sour relations you know with the special relationship and them saying things like that. But the, but the thing is that like um you know uh, he was just making a tongue in cheek joke which could be half true you know it's one of those things that's uh, satirical. I didn't think that was deeply offensive, but I thought that actually, yeah, that he's got a point. If Britain carries on the way it's going now, it may become that way if um, we're not careful. But at the same time, it, it, they, they turned a complete blind eye to all the lefties who were saying things like, um, why did you miss Trump or, you know, get, uh, don't miss next time, all of this sort of stuff. They didn't make a big deal out of that. And they underplayed or downplayed um, Trump's attempted assassination by saying in all of the newspapers things like um, Trump uh, was it Trump rally uh, was it uh, was it stopped by Secret Service after loud bangs heard or you know uh, Secret Services um, was it come in as Trump falls but no mention of guns no mention of bullets or any of this sort of stuff you know so they were really downplaying it and um, yeah, yeah. and and then of course well. One of the things that I do want to do, go into more depth about next time I make a walk and talk video of my own, is the fact that um, those same people who have been going on about hate speech for all this time, who have been telling us that we need to, or is it have the police come around and check our thinking, or that we need to go to prison for hate crimes, they're the very self same people who have been manufacturing hate, the worst hate of all. They've been telling us for the last, since 2016, that Trump is Hitler. And they've and imagine like this this assassin boy right? It was twenty years old. He's been listening to that since he was twelve, and um, and then you know he grew up thinking, really convinced, probably in his own head, that he's doing us all a favour by taking out the next Hitler because he didn't have a chance to take out the previous one, and he probably sincerely believed that. 
to be the case. Yeah. And we all of these done. people, all our politicians, all our leftoid twat media, all the American ones and all that, they've created this mess. You know, and I, I just think they've all got have. blood yeah. on their hands, all of them. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point you make there. Um, yeah. I think in terms of the culture wars, as it's called, mm. um, they're definitely going to intensify. Um, yeah. But what I noticed, yeah, the initial coverage, I happened to be up i think it was i don't know about 12 o'clock uk time yeah. and i was switching for about half an hour uh, between sky and bbc and initially like you say niall they were saying they didn't even mention an incident of a shooting so they were completely mm. they were completely um downplaying it but one of the things that i've noticed is yeah and this shows you well, kind of like what strange times we're living in but um sort of getting a gist of talking to a few family members and a few other people I know who aren't sort of into any of this stuff, very mainstream people, yeah. and take their lead from the news. They're quite happy to say, oh, it was a hoax. Trump, he, 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 was a fa he faked it in order to oh, increase God. his popularity. And they're the self-same people that would have called me a conspiracy theorist during COVID. So yeah. now they're conspiracy theorists and they're okay with it because they're saying it's a hoax. So that, you know, that's the, I'm not saying it wasn't, I'm not saying it is, but I'm just saying it's, it, again, it speaks to the ridiculousness of, of titles like conspiracy theorist. Yeah. Um, but also just, you are ro right, sorry, about the light being turned on. And we can see all the cockroaches because we can see the ridiculousness of everyone's position, really, that they're mm -hmm. adopting in this regard, um, with regards, sorry, to the Trump shooting or attempted assassination it, especially people who don't take a balanced view and adopt one side or the other it really is exposing just um how ridiculous it is to have such a unnuanced um uh, kind of knee-jerk reaction but lastly it, it is it is interesting because of course the mainstream media who have been hating on trump for all these years now mm -hmm. because they have to appear as reasoned and balanced we don't condone we don't condone political violence uh yeah. sorry iraq Af afghanistan syria um you know the list is kind of endless state sponsored oh, yeah. terrorism you know so it's exposing their hypocrisy total mm. and utter hypocrisy but i do think that um um because in a, in a way the mainstream media is sort of do have a bit of a love hate relationship with trump because he gives them good copy doesn't he yeah do you know what i mean he he increases their ratings so i think they're quite happy in a typical cynical sort of gaslight the general public way to now go kind of um soft on him and go all goo goo gaga and actually go oh he's an, an amazing man now trump because we know they're just so cynical the mainstream media well, yeah. so i think we may now see the the, the reemergence of you know Trump the savior figure even in the um, mainstream. Yeah, I mean the, the the thing about it though that it's so ridiculous is that they they're really disingenuous and they're really unconvincing. I mean a good example is that it's only just days ago um, that Biden was you know talking about Trump being the biggest danger and the biggest threat to the United States. And then there was that famous yeah. speech that he'd done, um, you know, with the red background. I'm going to get clips from that, I think, and put it in my next video, where he's saying about Trump oh, cool. and MAGA Republicans, they're the danger, the biggest danger. They want to take away your freedom. They're the biggest existential threat. And then immediately, as an attempted assassination on him, they're wishing him a speedy recovery. And I think the first question I'd want to ask Joe Biden, I'd want to go up to him and say, Mr. President, what do you mean you wish the biggest existential threat in the United States to have a speedy recovery? That's what I'd ask him, you know, because, <laughs> I mean, I'd like to see how he'd get out of that one. It's like their, their head would explode. Hang on a minute. He's an existential threat. What are you talking about? You want him to have a speedy recovery? You said that he was the biggest threat to freedom and democracy and everything yesterday. And now you want him to have a speedy recovery. What, what, do, you want, what do you expect from him once he's fully recovered then? You know, I mean, they're the yeah. questions you want to ask them because they, they are, like I say, they're, they're trying to gaslight everyone into saying, oh, forget everything that we just said about him and forget everything that we said for the last eight years about him being literally Hitler. Yeah, you want Hitler to have a speedy recovery, you know, and it's, you know, I think that you should point that out to the normies, every normie that you meet when you visit Morrison's <laughs> or Sainsbury's, just say, tell them that. 
and see if you can set off people's cognitive dissonance alarms and um, report to me later about it. I mean, I would if I was in the UK. I'm still I'm, I'm still <laughs> waiting for you to send me the normie spray. You talk about the normie spray. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I cool. thought I'd find that very useful. Um, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. From a sort of higher perspective, um, mm. I, d I do believe we're in extraordinary times in that I think, you know, we were talking about this before we came on air. Yeah. That, you know, the hidden hand, um, the powers that were, the whatevers. Mm. I think because they're scrambling now, and that's why they pulled COVID, it was an act of desperation, mm. not a power play. I think when they switch the agenda like they've just done, it's so obvious now everyone can see it. Yeah. Because they're just, they're just, they're just, they just run out of time. Yeah. They, they, they just literally, on a very simple level, the way I look at it is when you've lied, when you've manipulated, for you know, literally going back to ancient times, mm. um, it has appeared as if they've been able to c control humanity at will. And I just think um, eventually there is an expiry date to that. Uh, and we are seeing that expiration right now. With with this um, the the kind of collapse of woke with the ease with which we can now see agendas being switched like with Trump mm. and and all the rest of it and and so rather than like a lot of people in the alternative scene truthers who get their knickers in a twist I think it's actually a good thing I just think it means the soap opera is going to get more and more interesting and it means we the people um, you know I think we are going to be able to um, you know just um how can i put it you know ha perhaps have more of a say of our own destiny going forward it isn't quite as dark and as gloomy as as things look and, and more and more i just use humor i think during this time humor is a very very powerful tool because mm -hmm. it it sort of it um what it does is it um if i can split explain it kind of diminishes that sort of that intellectual need to know about what's going on, perhaps to try and deconstruct the attempted assassination of Trump and uh, and just go, oh, well, that's interesting. And then just and then just carry on with our lives. It kind of it disconnects us from that real emotional need to work it all out. And, and I think more and more as as things become even more absurd which they really are good mm. between now certainly and november and the presidential election we're going to probably see and hear things that it's like really that just can't be happening <laughs> and so it's good to arm ourselves with humor i, yeah. I think and as otherwise you can you can um get very depressed i know i have done in in, in, in the past and you know, and that can affect uh, our uh, friendships, our relationships with people, our day-to-day -day lives. And we don't want that to happen. No. Uh, it's a shame if that happens. Yeah. No, I was just actually thinking about um, one advantage that we have nowadays, and that is that within, within three or four days, an enormous amount of discrepancies and suspicious activity um may uh, you know made it so that we could all see it and everyone was talking about it everyone from lotus eaters to gb news and um all sorts of people were talking about um you know the really lax um security the fact that um that this everyone had seen this uh bloke climbing up onto the roof um and people had edited together different phone um images in like four different ones and made a collage and because you could hear donald trump on one of them they lip synced it with him talking while they then um, cut over to the bit where people are trying to point out that there's someone climbing on a roof. And then it was discovered that that building that the, 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 the sniper was on top of, well, it, was, it turns out a bunch of the counter snipers and um, Secret Service people and police were actually inside that building and didn't notice that the sniper was directly above them. One or two of the snipers that were pointing at them um, apparently yeah, didn't shoot in time or didn't get the instruction to shoot in time and then uh, Donald Trump was surrounded by a bunch of uh, what you call it DEI so there's lots of um, you know like he's about six foot two six foot three well you know I personally think you know as a five foot eight man I shouldn't be suitable for that job so um, they have lots of female no. operatives who, who can't cover him up and all of that uh, and they and then there was one uh, bit where a woman, uh, one of the, the Secret Service agents, couldn't even put her gun back into the holster. Uh, so the whole thing looked like a complete bungle up. I mean, I'd say that the, the agents who were there on the on the you know uh, trying to protect him were not in on it. But 
it does make you wonder. I mean, it makes me wonder, you know, if, if there is anything suspicious to this and if it was an inside job. It definitely wasn't faked by Trump and his team because that's too much of a high risk. But it does make me wonder, you know, um, how the hell did his security get to be that bad? I mean, it's just absolutely embarrassing, you know. And um, all these discrepancies and all of these problems were revealed very quickly. Um, you go back to 9-11, that would have been, wouldn't have been possible. It took months for a lot of the discrepancies to come out about 9-11. If not years, actually. Yeah, yeah if not years. And yeah. so one, of, one disadvantage that they have now is that if they do uh, try to create any, you know, like I say, if they do try to create any false flags or whatever now, if they do try to sort of um, create anything, um, they have to try much harder. They have a, a, a higher chance of bungling everything up. And social media, um, with the advantage nowadays of, um, you know, like things like X, what have you, um, with Elon Musk, uh, it makes it much, much more difficult for them to get away with it without being under scrutiny. So, you know, a lot of people say they're building a digital yeah. panopticon around us, but that digital panopticon is also being built around us so that we can scrutinize them better as well. And they lose just as much as we yeah. do by this. And they haven't worked that out yet. And um, this is the, the amazing thing. But, uh, you know, the more, the more I look at it, the more it just um, seems to me that, uh, that they're extremely desperate, they're extremely scared. I'm also wondering, why the hell is Robert De Niro going on about this all the time? Why, why is he talking about this? And um, it, it makes me wonder, is there a lot of, um, I don't know, child trafficking, nonsery and stuff like this that might be connected to Hollywood? And, uh, and that Donald Trump might actually be able to reveal a lot of stuff or declassify a lot of stuff. And they're actually desperate to stop this from coming out because, you know, the level and the scale of corruption, I can't think of a better reason for them to try to vilify him than to stop him from exposing the levels of corruption that exist nowadays. And, um, you know, right the way back, even that movie Sound of Freedom, I actually did manage to get a, uh, to watch that film, right? Um, that was, I don't know if you've seen that. Um, but it was a movie no. about no. Uh, a Homeland Security man. It's actually based on a true story. Uh, a man from the Department of Homeland Security went to some South American country, uh, or, you know, I think Colombia or Venezuela or something like this. Some bloke had had his um, kids nabbed off him to be trafficked, um, and they lured them into it by having some celebrity woman come around and say that they were going to do um, photography, dress and makeup photography for his daughter come to this hotel room at seven o'clock afterwards. So he goes to the hotel room, find that not only the kids are gone, but the entire team of people have gone. And then uh, a man from the Homeland Security in America discovers the boy and then goes to Colombia and goes out into the wild in Colombia and manages to nab back the girl and re reunite him with the parents. It just so turned out um, that uh, when this film was released, although it was a true story, about child trafficking, the woke were trying to stop people from watching the film. And I mean, right. why would they try to? Yeah. Why would they try to stop that from happening? I mean, yeah, you it does know, make you wonder. Yeah, it was very suspicious. They were doing everything they could to boycott it. And um, yeah, you know, it's not a film about um, you know, it's it's not a film full of racism or sexism or homophobia. It's a film about child trafficking based on a true story. And uh, I honestly yeah, wonder yeah. whether or not um, they're that desperate to stop him because, you know, and then, of course, um, it was only recently said that um, a few, uh, I don't know if you remember a few months back or even last month, Klaus Schwab was supposed to have been accused of all sorts of naughty stuff like that. And um, yeah, I yeah, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of corruption concerning stuff like this. And a lot of these, um, what you call it, compromat types people who get people into compromising positions in order to blackmail them to do the will if the compromatters get exposed then the whole house of cards falls down yeah i think i think um great points again i think they're on a bit of um a sticky wicket now because yeah. um um it's a part i mean part of this sort of managed decline we were talking about is how can we get people to the masses to still believe in the illusion while still making certain disclosures yeah. um, about all of the um, evil uh, and corruption that's been going on. And, and, and I think that's what they're kind of really, really struggling with now. Yeah. Um, 
just back to the Trump incident, of course, there are different schools of thought, aren't there? Yeah. There's this whole idea that such incidents, I know, within the more what you would call um, the black pilled, uh, or what I call the truth for trap, where people um, kind of lose their minds to too many kind of dark narratives, they would say, well, they deliberately do a kind of bungle job, you know, Allah, <laughs> 9-11, Mohammed Atta's uh, passport or ground zero, um, you know, building seven collapsing behind the BBC reporter. Yeah. Uh, these kind of anomalies um, and, and things like that. So, and some would even go so far as to say there's this sort of occult principle, uh, sorry, practice where they're gaslighting the public. And I believe there's also this idea of the revelation of the method in that they have to show what they're doing to the general public in some sort of way mm. to say it in a very simple way by revealing that they're doing a shitty job i personally think like you're saying now i think since the widespread use of smartphones and basically everyone's got a uh, the means to make a, f a film or video in their pocket mm. their tactics have changed yeah. um so what we see now is a lot of more subterfuge a lot more stitching together some real stuff so some real people will die then some faked footage then a little bit of crisis crisis actors so they kind of mix it all together um but i think they've moved more and more away which is actually a good thing from killing and blowing lots of people up in kind of western countries they're still quite happy to do that abroad of course mm, yeah. what john pilger called the unpeople the non-humans uh, yeah. uh, the western government's regard so i think that's what we've seen with this Trump incident, bits of real footage stitched with kind of um, some fake stuff. And um, yeah, you can, again, back to my point, you can lose your mind trying to trying to um, trying to work it all out. And um, you can sort of if, if you um, I mean, I've seen some memes online, which I think is silly, where they that footage where you have a. Um, I think he's where he's under the lectern and there's a picture of Trump and you can mm. see the blooded side of his face and people have kind of photoshopped in a bottle of ketchup or something like that. Now, on <laughs> one level, yeah, that's mildly humorous. But mm. I think if you, if you take the the um, view that it's completely faked or it was a complete setup, then you ignore the bigger picture. Yeah. And I know a lot of truth for types, they do that because I think there are interesting archetypal resonances with Trump in that I think um, due to the crisis of masculinity across the Western world, when you see a lot of young guys, they look very effeminate. They look very gauche, you know, the dandy. Mm. He still, um, even within the mainstream, you'll have these archetypal resonances. So he is in a way, he's a counter balance to that in yeah. that he's the very, you know, strident male archetype. Um, you know, strong in the, in, in the face of adversity. And I think if you're just coming from a very black and white uh, an initial response, you, we, it, you can miss those bigger kind of um, sort of understandings of what's going on. Yeah. And, and I think there, there is, there is um, sort of like, what, how should I say this sort of... Um, true for narrative whereby it everything you know those people that say everything is staged or yeah. everything is a hoax and mm -hmm. everyone's in on it and <laughs> putin is uh, part of the whole you know the he's part of the wef uh, yeah. and they'll show pictures of leading public figures with you know klaus schwab or the same types of people that um would say that uh, uh novak djokovic you know, when he chose not to take the fake vax, he was in on it and they'd show pictures of him mm -hmm. doing, you know, the, the Illuminati eye and all that. The people that become so sort of paranoid mm. and so psychotic, I would argue, that they see conspiracies and in everything and they think everyone and every, you know, and everybody is in control. And, and, and I don't and I don't think that the case is the case. And I think that Trump, the reason why I find him interesting is because there's so many things that are going on. So mm. many agendas, so many counter agendas, and perhaps one of them, you're right, Niall, is the whole um, child trafficking thing. I don't know. I've never really looked into it, but you could well be right. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the thing is that I'm, I'm only joining dots when I say this, but I hear a lot of people um, say that Donald Trump has, um, you know, got the classified information. 
on a lot of secret um, Hollywood stuff that's going on. And I see the desperation in the faces of people like Robert De Niro. Um, they're coming out and saying that, you know, that Donald Trump is, um, what is it, an existential threat and all of that. And, I mean, I can't take any of these people seriously when they say that. They seem like they're completely insane to me, you know? Um, mm, yeah. So, at the same time, it does make me wonder whether or not um, there is a lot of level of corruption in Hollywood. I mean, there's certainly a lot of talk about it. And whether or not um, these people in Hollywood do have a lot to hide, and maybe they know that um, if Trump gets in, the, uh, that they're doomed. And they think that because of the influence they do have, if they create this narrative of Trump being Hitler, which does seem to me to be an orchestrated, um, you know, very orchestrated, because, I mean, the thing is that if you were going to say that back in the day in 2016, that's one thing. But he's already had a whole term as president, and then he lost to Biden. Whether, yeah. of course, that, um, that was rigged or not, I don't know. But the fact is that he didn't take yeah. democracy away then. Not only did he not take democracy away then, but... He stopped the forever wars. He It was the only presidency I can think back, probably going back to the time of uh, Lyndon Johnson from late 1963 onwards, where America has not been keeping this forever war machine going on. He, he stopped it. And, yeah. um, you know, um, things like that. And then, of course, you know, back in the day, literally everything they say about him is debunkable. I remember watching Stefan Molyneux once, and he was saying about how, you know, the first thing that people say about him was that he's racist and sexist. Well, he then pointed out that Donald Trump was the first golf course owner in America to invite black members and the first successful president to use a female presidential campaigner. And when they were then, when they were going on about the grab them by the pussy thing back in the day, right? I mean, the yeah. thing is, the context is missing there. He's having a bit of locker room talk with someone he thinks he's in private. And he's just speaking, like, candidly. Um, I don't see that as being any different from someone like John Taylor of Duran Duran on tour in America after sniffing some coke, having a private conversation with one of his road crew. That's just rock star talk, really. And he, he, before he was a pop star, he was a, yeah. a, a, you know, a multi... He was a billionaire playboy. He was... Um, so, so... And that kind of way of behaving was championed back then, if you go back to the 1980s and the 1990s. You know? Well, social attitude, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I, so I just discounted that. I thought, well, so what? So what? He's now for male with a lot of money, a lot of status. He, he needs to beat the women off with a shitty stick. Of course he's going to be able to grab them by their beef curtains. I mean, bloody hell. I mean, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> I mean, so what? He said that. What the hell has that got to do with how well or how badly he's going to run the country? He didn't say that he wanted to cut their clitorises off, did he? He didn't say that he wanted them to be barefoot and go back to the kitchen or any of that stuff, you know? And he was, um, you know, he was, um, and he was very polite to the Queen when he met her. You know, and... Uh, yeah. And it's just, so, you know, they, they come up with all these things and they're always tenuous and they're always really you know i would say really bad you might not like someone having that sort of attitude but then again you know my, my whole well i don't necessarily consider myself um christian but then at the same time i kind of think that i've seen too much in my life to even be able to cast the first stone at this point so um who am i to yeah. judge him for the things he said you know i've i've said <laughs> the, yeah. we all have and you know like I say, is that you know he he's not he's not said that um, that you know he, he's not said about how much he loves the bomb like uh, like like uh, was it uh, Stanley Kubrick uh, was Peter Sellers's character in uh, Doctor Strange Love or anything like that has he? Yeah. You know when he went to um, when he went to meet Kim Jong Un when he went to meet Xi Jinping and Putin and stuff like that when he came back he um, you know he was doing good diplomatic relations and um, the world was a lot safer there. And then, you know, everyone's conveniently forgotten about how um, Joe Biden left the Taliban with better um, army infrastructure than even the British army has got these days. And Trump didn't do that. Yeah. You know, and... and uh, he, um, mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just back to saying the fact he's a bit of an outlier. I mean, yeah. some might say he... he positions himself well because he's obviously a wholehearted supporter of Zionism um you know um yeah. was were the were the americans behind taking out the 
Iranian general back in January 2020, mm. Sal- Salami, something I think his name was. Mm. Um, I don't know. I think he's just playing off different sides against one another because, uh, you know, there was that incident um, after the uh, Iranian general was killed in that mm. I- Iran fired a series of rockets at Iraq uh, at U.S. bases in Iraq, mm. but they also were said to have given the coordinates to the Iraqi government, so the U.S. military could could remove any assets, you know, yeah. um, so they weren't destroyed. And then Trump said, "Oh, a lot of military personnel have got headaches." Now, mm. if he was um, a gun-toting maniac, wouldn't he have just eviscerated Iran? He had the perfect excuse because they just attacked yeah. uh, a U- U.S. military. Do you, do you see what I mean? And yet, um, you know, he always stands shoulder to shoulder with Netanyahu and Israel. So do you see how he's very cleverly, he, mm. he, he's, 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 you know, and I, I know some people characterize him as like the fool from the tarot mm. uh, because he, he, he just flits around and he's, he constantly, you can't really pin him down, can you? No. Um, and I think that's why the mainstream media, you know, they 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 have so they can't really they can't frame him as being one thing or the other or they struggle and perhaps that's why they've um they've shifted the narrative and and just lastly i just want to say that um mm. i mean i think that after i think it was the staged presidential election in november 2020 mm. but after that and he went off and i believe he created his 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 own social media platform i thought he would just go off into retirement and i've i'm surprised that he's returned and um you know yeah and he's the main player again um i, I must admit I, I i've got that wrong uh you know people can debate until the cows come home as to why he's come back to be the main player is is that of his doing is is that of a bigger picture who knows so i must admit i got that wrong because i thought well mm. You know, on a sort of cultural level, well, they've used Trump now. You know, he's he's reached his expiry date, but no, here we are back again, yeah. the main man. Well, what, it, I, th- I think that's an interesting thing. Yeah, one of the things that bothered me, you know, when when uh, pre when we had pre Elon Twitter back in the day, um, when they actually um, took down his account, right? Um, yeah. You know, they took down the account of a sitting president of the United States. Yeah. Which, you know, to me is like, um, he only had a few days to go. Why didn't they at least have the decency to leave him keep his account until he'd gone? The fact is that they had silenced the President of the United States in that country with that constitution yeah. and those amendments means that, I mean, as far as I can see, isn't that supposed to be constitutionally unlawful, what they did? Um, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter whether, you know, the fact is he, he he could have been flipping Hitler, he could have been a dictator or whatever, but he was on his way out. Why did they have to silence him while he was still a sitting president? You know, and that's the thing that uh, bothers me there. So, you know, they've been treating him like an enemy of the state. And recently I've been looking at all of these uh, people who were supposed to be enemies of the state and seeing them in a different light. So um, I've been reevaluating everyone from, you know, even including Tommy Robinson. I don't want to go too much into detail about Tommy Robinson, but, you know, the fact that he's been treated Uh like an enemy of the state has made me curious about him. The fact that Nigel Farage was treated uh, as an enemy of the state has made me curious about him. Now, you know, I absolutely stand by it that I remember the real far right. I remember the bother boot wearing skinheads back in the day. And I most certainly have not changed my mind about the far right. And I know I haven't. And, um, but at the same time, if I am curious about these people and I want to, I'll listen to hundreds of hours of their interviews, I will know whether these people are far right or not. And I'm confident in myself to know that. And now, um, as they have made me curious about these people, I now realize these people are nowhere near as far right as we've been told that they are. And um, if anything, mm. they've, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of like, what you call it, lefty woke agenda, what was going on, the, um, the, the cultural Marxist agenda, whatever you want to call it, they've completely created the opposite scenario to the one that they're trying to create. Because they've now created a bunch of um, sensible, tempered, politically, you know, like I consider myself to be a floating center, center left-right person, if you like, in that way. 
um <laughs> you know but uh yeah like uh i do the political compass test every now and then occasionally I answer the questions wrong i always float around the center halfway down the libertarian <laughs> quadrant so I, I don't really go that much mm. to the left or the right only a little bit you know it's sort of like, um, say, for instance, that uh, if the political centre is London, the, as far the the, uh, the only extremes I ever get to are Slough or Dartford, you know, and that's it. <laughs> uh, so you know, uh, so that's how I see it. And according to the political compass test, I always test myself because I think, well, that's the best model to find out where I am in this. I know I'm in the political centre, and I know that I'm basically a centimetre, a, a, a hair's breadth to the left most of the time. Uh, but I look at these people and what they've done is they've made me curious about the other side. And then I realise that the other side are yeah. also politically on the centre. They've shifted the Overton window. Um, and um, basically now the only, the, only, uh, the, the only meaning of far right is, is that you are slightly to the right of Stalin or Chairman Mao. And, um, you know, that's, that's, the, that's basically the reality of it. And um, they can't convince me otherwise. You know, um, unless of course I dye my hair blue and then accuse and then get some <laughs> nose piercing and go around calling everyone every type of istophobe that there is, then maybe according to their model, I'm in the political centre. <laughs> you know, but it's it's utterly ridiculous now, and I I just don't buy any of it anymore. And um, you know, I mean to hell with them, and and they are like getting more and more stupid. Yeah. They are a cackistocracy of the worst kind whatsoever. They are the stupidest fools ever to have power that have ever existed, and um, they are going to end up, you know, falling on their swords as a result of their low IQs. That's the way I see it now. You know, sorry, I'm very ranty yeah. about it today. It's just, um, <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's it's yeah. fine. Um, uh, mm. um. I'm sorry, I'm aware of probably short on time. I just want to say with regards to political ideology, I even remember years ago mm. when I studied politics at undergraduate level as oh. a mature student, yeah. um, that one of the things I studied was a, a kind of left-right political model uh, shaped a little bit. I remember like a horseshoe where the left and right eventually kind of meet in the middle. Yeah. And that's probably, um, maybe that's the point kind of like that you're alluding to where we're coming to um mm. now um you know it's it is um it, we almost need to move beyond ideology don't we um uh, kind of yeah. like maybe ideologies are now just redundant and that's part of this whole new era that spiritually minded people talk about yeah we can no longer see see the world through the lens of ideology and um but it is hard because we've we've kind of created a world on that basis so where do we go from here yeah but we're still running on legacy it, it, it looks like it's only going to be more extremism yeah we're, we're running on legacy out of date legacy systems yeah. and we're still yeah. fighting the last wars this whole left and right thing we're still fighting in the 1940s you know oh it's ridiculous you know the the, yeah. the anti capitalists yeah. the so-called anti-capitalists that exist on the left now are they're still fighting um like uh, a capitalism of at least you know going back as far as the 1980s the religious people are still living in the 14th century <coughs> the, Mar the marxists <laughs> are still living in the 19th century the anti-fascists have only made it as far as the 1940s and we're living in a completely different world and we need new models and that's basically where we're at right now. So, um, yeah, I think more and more people will see this as time goes by. But, oh, well, I don't know what we uh, do about it. But, yeah, all right, I suppose we should wrap it up at this point. But, yeah, cheers for coming back anyway, Ants. And, um, no, until, no problem. Thank you for inviting yeah. me on again. It's very it's very good to be here and to speak to your, your listeners and your viewers and your followers. So yeah. thank you, Niall. Thank you very much. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.